All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all in and good. All right. Uh, listen, welcome uh, to the new AVID webinar series that we're starting here in 2020. Um, uh, this is going to be really good. We're going to cover a lot of really cool topics. And, uh, you know, I think just to get things kicked off, I, I really wanted to cover this topic today, uh, this idea of uh, the unified platform. You know, this is something that's not talked about very much out in the world. I don't hear many people talking about it, uh, but it's something that we have been working on for a long time here at AVID. And, uh, uh, you know, not to give away the punchline, but, I, you know, I really think this is going to change how things are done uh, in live sound, not only from the way people use and design their systems, et cetera, but also the way we manufacture systems and the way we address uh, the users and the needs of the market, right? So uh, uh, this is a pretty interesting topic to me. I hope it is for you. But let's uh, let's just kind of jump right into it here. So I'm going to start just by uh, going through some of uh, the industry challenges. You know, this kind of stuff has been going on. These challenges I'm going to cover have been going on for a long time now. This has been going on uh, for years in, in digital. And, you know, at certain points in the history of, you know, digital design and then Avid coming into live sound, but there are a bunch of these that we wanted to address. But when we started to make the move toward uh, S6L and the, the unified platform concept, we really put up a target list of things that we wanted to address. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't necessarily a matter of fact, or a, a, I mean, a matter of us just kind of saying, we're going to solve all the world's problems. You know, we, we certainly don't, can't control what our competitors do, et cetera, but we can control what we do. And what we wanted to do is, is really solve a lot of these problems, at least for our customers. And then I think in the grandest of all worlds, the world sees how we're doing it and they try to solve these problems outside the walls of Avid as well. So let's just kind of go through them here. So the first one is show file incompatibility between systems. Now, I, this one seems obvious because this was the, one of the first ones that we attacked uh, when we came into the market. We wanted to give users the ability to use the same show file regardless of what console they were on in our given line. We, we didn't want to make them have to learn two or three different versions of software, et cetera. So, but this is still going on outside the walls of Avid. In, in the world of digital consoles, there's still a lot of incompatibility uh, between show files, even within a given product line. Uh, add to that, there are multiple versions of standalone software uh, that are out there that address these other versions of software. So, you know, it's kind of, it kind of tumbles downhill really quickly. It gets very complex if you're a user, a mixer who is moving from system to system to system, even within a given product line, that can get very complex and very time consuming to do. So that is certainly something we wanted to address and, and make sure that wasn't an issue. Uh, you know, safe to say there are a lot of surface engine and IO component incompatibilities out there. And really this has a lot, as much to do as this existence of different console classes uh, in the world, uh, you know, different builds, all kinds of things. And it just makes for some incompatibilities, but it also for the users and the sound companies of the world, it makes it very hard to be nimble and adjust your system sizes or scale your systems for the need, right? And keep quality there, all kinds of things like that. So it, it looks kind of innocuous there, but it's actually something that's very important and, uh, and needs to be dealt with in the digital world, right? Uh, of course, we have varying sound quality and build quality uh, that creates these classes of consoles. You know, you, I mean, you think somebody like Mercedes, they have S-Class versus M-Class, et cetera. Uh, that all has to do with cost, but it also has to do with quality. You know, it, there is, a, it's not even an unwritten rule. It is a written rule. As you go down in price, you're going to go down in sound quality. You're going to go down in build quality if it's trying to do lots of things. There, there is that magic ratio of build quality, sound quality, and cost, right? And as you go up, get to an expensive product, it should be a really good quality build, it should be really good sound quality, but it's everything in between, right, in a, in a product line. Well, we felt like in the live sound world especially, we needed to address that because in live sound, there is every range of product working at every range of show. You might see the, the smallest, cheapest product sitting out there working on one of the biggest shows, you know. So the same demands are there in terms of sound quality and all kinds of things like that for that show. So, you know, it, it shouldn't get cheated just because it's using a smaller console. Obviously, in all those different console classes, there are, there are differing workflows on all of them. If you learn how to use, you know, the midline version of a product, it doesn't necessarily mean you know how to use the other products in the line. You might have to go through 
another steep learning curve to learn how to operate even an adjacent product uh, in the same product line. Uh, recording is a reality in live sound today. We have recording setups for every one of our live shows that are out there today. Everybody's doing multi-track recording. But because of that, the, the ways you interface, the types of recorders, the capabilities is just all over the map in terms of how you get this connected. So uh, again, within our product line, we wanted to be able to say, look, we gotta make this easy, reliable, predictable, all of those things. We, we don't want to ha have this be some huge lift that we have to do every day just to be able to multi-track report. And then of course you have, uh, you can have varied and really complicated software installations and update processes. I'll even add authorizations into this, uh, this bullet for plugins, et cetera. You know, the, the way that we handle all of those things system to system can get really messy. I, I mean, just trying to remember all the different ways that you can install something or all the different landmines that have to happen to install something man it, it's it's tough to stay on top of it out there I, I really have a lot of empathy for the sound companies that are having to manage multiple manufacturers with all of these different processes for you know updating and keeping their products in play and then of course when you have all these different classes and these different builds of consoles well if you know, cost is a function of the parts, et cetera, that are being used, then you're going to have a matrix of spare parts that is just enormous for one product line. You know, you may have 10 consoles in a product line that use all different spare parts, different faders, different knobs, different LEDs, et cetera, whatever it's going to be. So uh, we wanted to address that as well. We wanted to try to uh, manage all of these kind of bullet points for our systems going forward. And then, of course, all of this plays into creating uh, relatively short lifespans for products. You know, it's kind of one of these unwritten rules that, you know, the, uh, or untalked about rules, I should say, where within the confines of a manufacturer, you know, the products that are going to get the most attention and the most development over time are the products that are making the most money. And that's not necessarily the top of the line products. You know, a lot of times the lowest end product will make the most money for the company and so it'll get all of the development resources whether it's human resources or financial resources so we wanted to address that as well and and as you'll hear in this story uh, that's kind of what we did at Abbott uh, we took a very I don't want I don't want to call it risky it was a very energetic very forward-looking uh, approach to how we were going to make products going forward all right so let's talk about kind of the unified platform or unified platform concept and the goals uh, that we were trying to achieve with it uh, you know, and people, I, I, I'm surprised how many people don't make the association here, but you know, the unified platform is really kind of the, the genesis of it was in the venue live sound environment. If you guys remember when we came to market in 2005 with the venue live sound environment, that's kind of what we were trying to create. You know, we were trying to create this ecosystem of products that would all kind of work together, et cetera. Now, uh, to be fair, I don't, I don't think we hit that goal by any stretch of the imagination because, uh, there were a lot of obstacles at that point, none the least of which, when we started at Digital Design, we started with one product. It was the D-Show, the Apple Rach racks, and the Stage racks. Uh, and we had no idea whether it was going to succeed or not in the market. We were brand new to the market. Nobody knew about Digital Design at that point. Uh, but, you know, very happily, it was very well adopted uh, and, and really kind of changed the game in the live sound market for a good period of years there. Uh, but our underlying architecture there was trying to create this ecosystem once we started to get going. Uh, but really, the probably the best example of what we did there was with the software, right? We were able to create software that worked in all of our products going forward. But in our mind, we were always, we, throughout that entire product development, we were learning the lessons of what was going to happen uh, when we do that. So uh, hopefully we've, we've captured it with the unified platform. Uh, here's the one that's really important to understand uh, is that if if we get to unified platform, and you'll understand what this all means by the end of this, hopefully, it's going to streamline and reduce our manufacturing needs. If we can reduce the amount of manufacturing and research, research, uh, research and development that is needed to be able to build and make these products, we'll be able to do all sorts of things bigger and faster and better. Uh, so that was certainly a goal of unified platform was to streamline that process uh, because you know, again, I, I kind of have the luxury of being inside the company for a, a long time now, and I've kind of seen this take place. And as I said, you know, when we were in venue live sound environment and D-Show came to market, 
you know, at that time, remember, Avid was, Avid owned DigiDesign at that point, and there was Media Composer and Pro Tools. And in terms of Pro Tools hardware, there was Icon and the audio interfaces. So, you know, they, they kind of had, I, I, I'll call it the luxury of a serial production stream meaning a lot of work would be done in engineering on Media Composer, et cetera. And as they were winding down on a product, Pro Tools would kick into play and develop a product, maybe some hardware development, et cetera. And then it would just go back and forth and back and forth. And they did that very successfully for a long period of years. Well, here comes the redheaded stepchild of, you know, live sound into this mix. And now you've got three tiers that have to go in series, right? And the development time, for those products actually ended up becoming very long. It took us a long time to get to market as well as these resources getting used up for three product lines now. So, you know, kind of in our mind, we started thinking, wow, we're going to have to rethink how we're doing things here. Uh, we needed to reduce the R and D effort. You know, that's one of the things that unified platform does very, very beautifully uh, is that it streamlines the R and D. If we, if we are making products like we did in, uh, the venue original line where we have a, you know, the D show system and then we're going to move to pro profile. Well, those were complete new builds. They, that took an entire new R and D spin up, a new beta spin up, a new build spin up. Everything had to happen kind of from the ground up again. And then when you get to SC 48, we start the whole process again and it just lengthens the amount of time that is spent putting together products very dramatically. And ironically, I never thought I would say this in my life, but in live sound, you know, in, after the year 2000, live sound development really started to get fast. It used to be a, a traditionally a very slow developing market, but man, it started spinning up and you were getting a lot of turnover of products. So if you couldn't keep up with the demand there, you were going to get behind the curve. You know? uh, we wanted to get, uh, at, at playing right to that conversation, actually, we wanted to get more product to the market quicker. That was ultimately the goal, uh, to be able to give um, the customers more choices right out of the gate, as opposed to releasing, well, we're going to release the big thing. And then maybe five years down the road, you get all the way down to the smaller thing where there might be a lot of users. We needed to close that gap of time very dramatically. That was one of our goals with Unified Platform. In addition, and some of these seem obvious, but as you start to think about them, you know, you start to get some respect for what happens if you have multiple classes of products in your line, think about the demand that puts on for tech support and training, right? Now you have to greatly expand your training and your, uh, your tech support uh, processes and people because you have such a, such a variance, such a disparity in all the products and how they're built, right? So uh, we wanted to reduce that as well. It's all about just getting efficient and fast. Reduction in testing and qualifications, same drill, right? Where you have lots of products in a product line. Well, all of them are going to require their own test grids. If you have individual software running on each one of those products, each one of those software bases is going to need its own test grid every time there's a feature release that comes with it, right? So if we could eliminate all the disparity in it, now everything happens much faster. Everything happens much more reliably because you're only working on one as opposed to eight. So you kind of see the, the, the picture there, right? Uh, we wanted to create, and this is where we kind of got tripped up in the original venue line uh, because it was pre-audio networking per se, uh, but we wanted to create a single operational and interconnection model for the entire line of products, meaning it all operates exactly the same and it all interconnects the same. There's no specialization in it. It's all working from the same thing. And again, it's aimed at making your life as easy as it makes ours, right? We want to give something to you that you can find easy to hook up, easy to maintain, easy to work with, as opposed to thinking, well, I've got to have one of these, I've got to have one of these for this system, but not for this system. You know, we, we really wanted to get rid of that line of thinking because it, it was becoming a really heavy lift for the sound companies in particular. Uh, once you're on a platform like this, then you have the opportunity to entice third-party software and hardware manufacturers to contribute to our platform, right? Uh, there's probably no better example of that than plug-in processing. You know, I shouldn't be lost on anyone that, you know, Venue is still the richest platform out there in terms of the variety of plug-in processing that you can use on it. We, we are, we're open to all kinds of third-party processing manufacturers to contribute to this platform, right? That's a, that's a great example of it. So we wanna actually expand that to hardware and give 
other companies the ability to make hardware that integrates to our platform systems and works very uniquely within that platform. I'll give you some examples of that today. And, you know, I mean, this is the catchphrase here. I mean, ultimately the goal was to provide live sound users and owners the most capable, flexible, longest lasting mixing system on the market. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do, right? You want to make it once and just sell a whole bunch of them and get everybody using them. That's the goal. There, okay. So that's our, that's our concept. That's our, our goals. That's, that was our kind of our mission statement was to, to deal with all of these things when this went into development. All right. So the way we're going to do this uh, and uh, is really just with modularity. We're going to it, really the, the strength of this whole concept, this whole program is in its modularity and what we can do with these modules, right? So uh, it, this is what I, I just labeled it next generation console manufacturing because I don't think there's anybody working really truly to this scale and this depth. So the idea here is to design it once and then use it everywhere. This is gonna be a theme that you're gonna see throughout this entire webinar today. Design once, use everywhere. We wanna have, if we can do that, if we can design it once, and then use it in all kinds of products. Think about the streamlined manufacturing that takes place there. Now you're only really manufacturing one set of things or maybe two sets of things that are gonna make all of these products. So it cleans up that manufacturing process very quickly and makes it very predictable. Uh, we have, uh, and again, this is kind of internal process. I just wanna give you some insight into this and get you thinking about these things. If we only develop a set of modules that are gonna make lots of products, as opposed to developing lots of products that are all disparate, then internally we don't have to compete for development funds, for research and development funds, for human resources, because everybody's always working on one thing, right? You're not changing directions midstream to try to make another product. Uh, it just, it, it cleans up your, your uh, operational aspect of your company dramatically. Uh, in terms of testing, you end up with a singular test grid now. If, I, if I'm going to take that channel knob module that's shown up there and use it in all the products, well, from the manufacturing perspective, I only got to test it once. Once it's built and we verify that it works, then just keep using it and keep using it in different and more meaningful and exciting ways, right? Software and feature enhancements improve the, the entire product line. This is a really, really important one because... You know, think about what happens now if we have this entire product line that is built on this platform and it's working on one software platform. As we increase features in that software, it's actually improving all of the products in the line, not just one given product. So as things improve, every product improves and er the whole thing just pushes together at the same time in advancement. It's really beautiful. Same thing applies for reliability. If we run across a bug fix that needs to happen or some sort of hardware problem uh, that we've picked up on in manufacturing, once we fix it, we've fixed everyone in the line. All of the products suffer the benefits of it uh, by getting fixed, right? It's not like we have one development stream where it's like, oh, that console is having a problem. Let's, let's get a team on that and fix it while other consoles are continuing to work. No, once we put the team on the fix, it repairs everything in the line. Really, really great. And then finally, of course, in modules, as it should be obvious, you have drop-in replacements for fast repairs. I mean, we work in live sound. There is urgency involved. We need to be able to fix things quickly. Sometimes we need to be able to fix things while the thing is in operation uh, in terms of hot swap. So with a modular mentality there, we can do that very, very effectively on the consoles without having to have uh, a lot of downtime there in terms of a hardware failure. And then uh, finally, as I mentioned earlier, the potential for third, third party manufacturer contribution there. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, we build a uh, hardware developer's kit, we give that to a manufacturer, and maybe they make a, a module that goes in the console. Maybe it's a panner or something along those lines. That opportunity is there uh, for us to do that, but only in a unified platform sense, because the idea that would be that if a manufacturer is going to put their R&D dollars and their research and development into developing something that is going to go to work on the platform, well, they want the widest audience for it, not just a, a single product audience. They want it to work on all of the products in the line, which is exactly what will happen in Unified Platform. And then, of course, it, the quicker we make all these things, all these bigger products, the quicker we completely realize the entire product line, the longer it can be in the market, 
right? There's nothing worse than having a product line that, that stretches out over a period of years only to have the end products go away quickly because the company moves to a next generation platform. You know, that we have, might have a product that releases very near the end of the product cycle for one generation and then the company moves on. That's, that's really a bummer for users. So again, unified platform will solve that problem. All right, so we think we've done it, honestly. Uh, we, I, I can, with a very straight face, read this right to you and totally believe every word of it. The Venue's SXL Unified Platform is the industry's only live sound product line with 100% software and show file compatibility. Uh, it's, a, it's a staggering thing to say. I never thought we would get to the point of saying it, but it, it's really cool to be able to say this and show it. So I hope you dig this. All right, so we're going to start right at software here, obviously. Uh, you know, it, it, this is kind of our, uh, our hallmark with the original Venue series was to be able to design software that worked throughout that entire product line for all of those years. Uh, but we certainly, when we started developing S6L and the platform concept, we absolutely knew we have to give those users a path onto this new console platform with their software. They have to be able to take older show files from as far back as we could go and bring them in on the new system and go right to work. Uh, this, this venue software had to kind of be their anchor because as you guys all know and have seen, this is a very different looking product than the previous product. So we wanted to give them something that they could anchor their, their eyes and their mind to and the venue software was certainly that. Uh, and I think once they got on the product, then they started to realize, wow, this actually is, this is venue, okay? So, you know, the idea is complete and full show file portability uh, you could take plug uh, show files from the previous generation and bring them right in onto uh, S6L. Uh, legacy show file compatibility. Uh, we wanted show file compatibility throughout the entire line as well. We didn't want, you know, we, don't, we you know we don't want to disrupt that. Uh, one code base for all the software. So there's not two development teams trying to develop features. It has to be one team working on one unified platform base. Uh, that allows for obviously really focused development. I mean, it allows, and if you guys have noticed it, I, I mean, I'll brag on this a little bit here. Uh, you know, over the past two, three years now, just the sheer number of software releases with meaningful, meaty feature enhancements in it has just been breathtaking from Avid here. I, 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 I've never seen anything like it in my time, my, my 15, 16 years there. Uh, I mean, the, the software team is just cooking right now in terms of getting great really great features out to the market. Uh, it allows for faster feature growth. Obviously, if we're only working on one code base, we have the same guys working on the software all the time. They become very connected to it, can become very familiar with it. Uh, there's great interaction between the users like me and Ryan and Rob Allen and Chris Lambrex. All of those guys were really tied to all the users in the market. You know, people like Sean Sully, contribute a lot to this and it becomes this really rich environment of software development. It's, it's played out really, really wonderfully. Uh, we can update it until we decide to stop updating it. You know, software is just such a cool thing in this regard. It's very much like mixing, right? Where you never really finish mixes, you just stop working on them. Well, software is a very similar thing here. You know, we'll, we'll stop <laughs> adding things to it when, it when it makes sense to do that, which would probably be moving on to a new product. And then the most important piece of it from you guys' perspective, obviously, is to have a singular, singular interface experience, right? It doesn't matter what product I'm on. I know that software inside and out. Now it's just a matter of operating that software with the given product, right? So a very, very uh, predictable, very reliable experience. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at how we kind of, how this really came to play in in Avidland, the first product that we released to the market uh, from this kind of unified concept was the S6 recording consoles. And, and the S6 is a, uh, a control surface that is used with Pro Tools, right? Pro Tools is the engine, S6 is the control surface. Uh, but then we followed that up with the S6L, you know, L for live, S6 live. But notice they all use the same modules, right? It, even though they look slightly different, they're screened slightly different, they're certainly programmed different. Physically, they are the same modules. So you, if you had uh, an X6 knob module and an S, uh, CFM, a channel fader module for S6, you would build those and then just build it into whatever size console you need to build for the given application that you are trying to sell into. 
Well, those same modules would come to play for S6L as well. We would just take those same modules, make them work in a live sound workflow, but physically they're exactly the same module. We take and build our products into live sound, right? We build the S6L series. Same thing applies for master modules, even though they're different master modules, the underlying architecture and mechanics of it is essentially the same. It's just being deployed in a different place. We make it once, use it everywhere, right? So master module goes to the uh, S6 control surfaces and a similar master module that's built a little more customized for live sound would go into the live sound product, right? So here we are, right? We've built three things, but are able to make multitudes of different consoles and products out of it. Uh, think about what that would mean from a manufacturing point of view, right? You're, gonna, you're just going to do it so much quicker and so much more efficiently than you've ever done it. So let's take a look here. This is kind of the, the platform design philosophy. And remember, I said you're going to see this a bunch. So it's design once, build many, right? So with that one set of modules and architecture, we can just build out completely different size, different scaled uh, control surfaces for use in whatever... Uh, price point you guys can get to whatever use it needs to go to whatever workflow whatever job size you can pick the right surface for it and the beautiful part of it is it's interchangeable right you can have the system sitting there unplug the big surface plug in the small surface and your show file will scale to it and allow you to operate it it doesn't matter you can operate the same show file with the 16c that you can operate with the 48d okay so common workflow very very common Firmware updatable, same sort of thing. We'll always be doing firmware updates, making it better net underneath the hood. And it creates a long product lifespan. I mean, think about this now, fellas. Where are we at now? We're three and a half years into the lifespan of Unified Platform and S6L now. And look at the rich selection of control surfaces that you have here already. And there are more on the way. You know, So hang in there. It's going to be really cool to watch this. How about in terms of engines? engine sizes. Remember, our engine is disconnected from our soul, uh, control surfaces. It's on a network, right? So we displace that engine away from the control surface. Well, it's a similar philosophy, right? Design once, build many, right? So here you see three completely different engine scales, all in the same architecture, using the same kind of frame, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, it's just kind of reusing the same product to scale these engine sizes. Very common architecture. And again, plays to the longest lifespan. How about one more? Let's go multi-format I.O. boxes. Oh, well, a similar concept in our I.O. boxes here. Design once, build many, right? All built out of the same components, right? And it's important, This is again, this is kind of a nuanced thing. Here we have identical sound quality, regardless of where you are in the line. If you're at the bottom end of the line in terms of cost versus the top end of the line in terms of cost, it's not similar sound quality, not you know, the same sort of sound quality. It is identical sound quality because it's the same preamps and converters used in all the boxes, right? So it's like, like even here, if you take a look at stage 64 versus stage 62 or stage 32, excuse me, those are the same modules. One is just turned horizontally and rack mounted, right? But they are exactly the same components. You could take that stage 32 module out, turn it up vertical and put it in the stage 64 and go to work, right? It's the same stuff. Even the local I.O., which isn't on a blade, well, the I.O., the inputs and the output circuitry, is the same that is in the blades, right? So it's, you don't have a, a different sound quality if you're going to use that as local I.O., identical sound quality. Common architecture uh, for all of it, and it's speaking directly to the blade concept, and firmware updatable. And, you know, firmware updatable plays right into the stage 16 there, because as many of you know, stage 16 came from the E3 era right? It was operating at 48K, et cetera. And, it, it, I, and to be completely transparent, it's not the same componentry as the other stage racks, but it is really close because it came from the same era of development. That is a fantastic sounding stage box for anybody that has used it. But what we were able to do with firmware update is take it from a 48K model up to 96 and integrate it on the network uh, in the unified platform. So it worked out great. Great example of what firmware updating can do for you. And of course, longest product lifespan. Here, you have, stage 16 is a perfect example of that, where that product has been around for a long time now, probably six, seven, eight years, but yet it has a completely new life on the unified platform now. It's going to exist for a long time for us there.
So here we go uh, into the unified portfolio of solutions, right? This is the products that we have available to it. It is control surfaces, engines, and IO boxes. Uh, so that's what we currently have as the menu on the platform. It is going to continue to grow. So here, the idea is just simply this, right? That all of this works with everything. Everything works with everything, as we say around here now. That's kind of the mantra of what we want to do. All of this works together uh, and allows you just almost, I, I won't say infinite possibilities, but you have so many possibilities to be able to uh, uh, build these systems. How about third-party expansion? Let's talk about that for a second. So obviously, control surface, engine, and I.O. products, you know, we want to be able to expand those. There, uh, there are always going to be more of those coming, I believe, in our, in our development model. Uh, Pro Tools and Venue Link is a great example of how we can take an attached product, even though it's in our own product line because we all work for the same company, but where we can take that and bring it into Unified Platform and do something really unique with it compared to all the other places that it could interconnect. Same thing with Waves, you'll see that here. Waves is a similar product where it will work with all the other consoles on the market in, in some form or another, but once we get it in on the platform and do our interconnection and operational scheme on it, it's very unique. It, it, it works unlike anybody else's on the market. Luminex, we just recently uh, qualified Luminex AVB switches. I think that's in the 6.3 release. Uh, this is a product that is attached to our systems. It's going to allow you to do star point interconnection as opposed to ring topology uh, connection. It's just an attached product right now, a very important one, but it's just an attached product. But we would love to be able to look at getting that deeper into the platform so that we can have some unique capabilities uh, of interconnection and audio transport there. Third-party software developers, of course, uh, Pro Tools, I mean, uh, plugins are the best example of that, as I mentioned earlier. That'll always be expanding, I believe, into our world. We're always looking for more developers that will develop for Unified Platform. And then finally, third-party hardware developers, right? We want to look out into the market for other hardware manufacturers that can make something that can really enrich the, the, the concept of the Unified Platform. All right, so let's just take a look at a couple of these of what happens when it's actually in on the platform and what can happen to these products. So one of the integration benefits that we have with Unified Platform is that all systems on the Unified Platform, all of them, regardless of size, have the capability to record 128 tracks and playback on all Unified Platform systems, right? <clears throat> Secondly, if we integrate it to Pro Tools, we have the ability to record redundantly from any of these systems with just two simple Cat5 cables, right? It's just a Cat5 cable up to a Macintosh computer and you can redundantly record 128 tracks and playback 128 tracks as well. In addition, we have transport control built into our control surfaces. So if you wanna take transport control of the Pro Tools software, you can do that right from the surface uh, with, our, with our interconnection. All of that takes place through that single Cat5. Uh, finally, we have the ability, uh, also we have the ability to automatically build Pro Tools sessions. When you're connected to a venue console and you open up a new Pro Tools session, uh, you can be given the option of create from venue. And what this will do is create a Pro Tools session that is already, uh, automatically named and patched to match your show file. You can be recording within a minute of opening the session and going, and that's something that's unique to the platform. It's unique to our integration, this concept of venue link that all happens down that Cat5 along with the recording capability. In addition, we have it integrated to our snapshot system so that if you are in virtual sound check, you can actually navigate Pro Tools via markers that were placed there when it was recorded by recalling snapshots, right? I can recall a snapshot, it will go to that song in Pro Tools, we can go into playback and work on our mixes for that song. A very unique integration very powerful. It is so blindingly fast to be able to do this compared to how we used to do it in the past. It's just so impressive. Really, really fun. All right, let's take a look at Waves integration on the platform. So uh, Waves integration on the platform is with, uh, we give you the ability to do two servers into an option card that we put in our engine. We've built the option card and integrate their servers directly to it. So again, simple, uh, redundant Ethernet connections here. Just a simple Cat5 cable up to that option card. No additional hardware needed other than the option card and the servers. Uh, single waves authorization for the servers. You don't have to do the purchase two 
authorizations for your plugins to be able to re run redundantly. And we give you the capability to do that here with one authorization. Uh, it has deep integration into our software. It, all of the Waves plugins show up in our plugins rack. Uh, all the settings, et cetera, store in our show files and in our snapshots. So it's, it's integrated into the system very, very deeply here. Get all tactile control for the plugins on the surface as you, itself. As you can see on S6L, we have lots of knobs, lots of faders, lots of encoders. So you can have full control of those plugins uh, from the surface itself. Not a lot of mouse work required there. And then finally, it's also compatible with legacy show files, right? So if you had an old venue show file uh, from the, the D show and profile era that had Waves plugins in it, you can load that on SXL. And if you have the Waves servers integrated, it will load those plugins and your settings, and you'll be able to go right to work. No fuss, no muss. And great. And the best part is that when you're on the unified platform, this, this capability is available to all the E6 engines, right? all of the E6 engines would have this capability. So regardless of where you're at in the product line, top to bottom, you could have Waves integration to your show file and your operation. So finally, we'll just end up with this, just kind of uh, another way of visualizing this. Obviously, Wave Sound Grid is on the inner circle of the bubble here. Uh, we've got them inside that world, uh, working great with our systems. Uh, Apple, in and of themselves, are kind of on the outside, even though Pro Tools is on the inside. Uh, Apple is a great attached product, right? That's an example of where the OS, the Apple OS, contains the AVB drivers, and that gives us the ability to simply hook up a Cat5 cable between the surface and the computer and be transporting large numbers of uh, tracks of audio back and forth. Uh, so really great attached product. Luminex, uh, also an, a great attached product here. That is going to be our uh, AVB switching networks to be able to create primary and redundant star networks for large integrations. This is just going to be a godsend, really, because it's going to make things so much easier to interconnect uh, where you're connected across large distances within a given uh, arena or, you know, performing arts center or anything like that. You know, it's just going to make the whole process so much easier to connect and troubleshoot. And then, of course, uh, we are always courting third-party hardware developers. Uh, to maybe either modify their products or, you know, join in the manufacturing of a product to enhance the unified platform uh, process and experience. So uh, really excited about that. I, I, I know a lot of what's going on now. It's really exciting what we're going to see over time here. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very excited about it. Okay, so that, my friends, is unified platform. Uh, let's see how we did in terms of dealing with all of these things once we developed this concept of unified platform. So obviously one was show file incompatibility between systems. Pretty sure we knocked that one on the head. 100% show file compatibility between all S6L systems and legacy venue systems. Multiple versions of standalone, not on the platform, one version of standalone software for all S6L systems. Surface and engine IO components, not fully interchangeable, not on the unified platform. That is all interchangeable in our world. Varying degrees of build quality and sound quality, creating classes throughout a product line, not in unified platform. It is identical build and sound quality because all the systems are using the same components. Differing workflows, not here. Of course, identical workflows. They're all identical products, just scaled to a different size. Complex and varied recording. I don't think you could do any more simple recordings than we do with uh, venue uh, in terms of channel counts, et cetera. It's just so simple and easy to do it. Uh, varied and complicated software installation. Uh, certainly when we started, our, our, our process was a little complicated, but we've worked really hard to streamline that, streamline that now. And for any of you guys that have updated to 6.3, I think you see how easy that process is now uh, to update. We're always working on improving that process. Certainly with the release of 6.3, we're doing a, a lot of, we call it product hardening <clears throat> in terms of trying to make the product more firm and easy and reliable in terms of things like product, or, I mean, software installation, et cetera. So uh, we're always working on that. Uh, unique spare parts throughout the system classes, <clears throat> excuse me, not, not in unified platform, but again, because it's all reuse, right? It's all using the same products uh, to create just different scales of products. And relatively short lifespans, I, and for costly technology, I mean, it's, it's not, technology is expensive. 
well, this is going to last for a long time. We're going to be working on this platform and developing it and making it something special for a long time to come. Uh, so, you know, if you make the investment early, you're going to make a lot of money uh, with this product over time. So uh, I think we knocked that one on the head too. So unified platform, really cool thing. I hope you put it in your lexicon of terms and uh, can use it talking about people. Uh, so we're going to move on over. That concludes today's little foray into the unified platform. And we are going to jump over to some questions and answers here before we get too deep into the hour. All right. All right. So let's see. Okay. So I got some questions coming in here. So here's the first one. So how long does it typically take to move an old show file to SXL? I, honestly, it takes as long as it takes to just hit the load button and load the show file. I mean, if you had a ton of plugins in it, it might take a couple of minutes to do it, but it's going to recognize it and load it in for all intents and purposes immediately. You don't have to do a whole lot there. You just need to bring it into our file architecture and load it in. Anybody else? All right, here we go. Can you talk about connecting to third-party personal mixers like Allen Heap ME systems? Uh, well, you know, even though we use AVB, uh, you know, I, I guess I'll start this by just saying, you know, even though we use AVB as our backbone, we don't limit our connection possibilities to only AVB. Uh, we have Dante interfaces on stage racks. Uh, we have MADI interfaces, all kinds of things. We, we really don't want to exclude any connection capability uh, to doing that. Uh, so really, it's just about finding what format of audio needs to happen on your on your Allen and Heath system, and then finding the path for us to deliver to it. Uh, I, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I'm not that familiar with that system. I, I'm talking about it in very broad terms here. But if it's just simply a matter of getting audio to it, uh, I don't get the, uh, the idea that it is a bi-directional system. It's just sending stems or sources out, and someone else is mixing it. So it's just a matter of audio transport there. All right, next question. Anybody else got one for me? Here we go. Uh, can you open an Avid SXL show file into a profile console? Unfortunately, no, we can't go backwards. We can only move forwards there uh, because uh, you know SXL, there's so much more IO capability, so much more capability in SXL. By the time you went through a uh, a process of deciding what was going to come from SXL back into your profile, it would just be so difficult to do it. It's at some point, it's almost, I don't want to say not worth it, but from the engineering resources to be able to make that stuff work backwards was really, really difficult. I'd be the first to say to you, it was probably a lot more difficult than we thought it was going to be in the beginning. And that's why we backed off of that a little bit. So no, unfortunately you can't go backwards there. How similar is it mixing on 16C versus Big Surface like 32D? Well, I, I can speak honestly directly to this because uh, I'm all the touring that I did, uh, you know, through 2017, 2018, maybe even in 2019, was all on 32D, with the exception of a, a couple of shows, and these were pretty big shows. Like one was a big. Uh, benefit show that I did in Los Angeles, and I mixed it on 16C. I had 16C connected to a 192 engine, and I, I mean, we were probably well over, we were probably close to pushing 100 inputs on that show. And I, I just, I, I stood there just kind of in amazement at how easy that was to do on 16C. Uh, I, I, of course, it requires some thinking, so it, you know, in your mind of, okay, well, what are things that I I need to ensure that I can get to quickly, et cetera, on the console. But it doesn't take much of that because the navigation capabilities uh, in terms of spills and grouping on SXL is just exceptional. So, that, you know, you, it, between that and the programmable layouts, I mean, I just did a show where I just constantly had the 16 faders up that I needed to get to. And if I needed to dig down or tunnel down, it was just a spill to get to it and go to work. I, I was stunned at how easy it was to do it. So I, yeah, you make that transition very, very easily in my opinion. Is it possible to import a show file as a snapshot into a, into another show file? I, I'm going to, I'm going to guess what you mean there. Is it possible to import a snapshot into a show file? Yeah. Yeah. So import snapshot. Yeah, absolutely. It is. 
Uh, I was going to say, maybe I could show that here. Let me, let me take a look at something here. Let me get out of this. Let's go here. Are you guys seeing that venue screen right now? Can somebody just firm that up? I don't have a confidence monitor here, so I'm sorry to say. Okay, so uh, in terms of importing uh, show or uh, snapshots, the answer is absolutely you can. So you can just go and highlight a snapshot or highlight a uh, show file and import snapshots from it, right? So I would be importing snapshots from a given show file into the show file that I have loaded right now, right? So you can see this where I can import snapshots and events. So yes, you sure can do that. Uh, can you tell us about remote control options? Uh, remote control options right now are, uh, we have an iPad app uh, that is a remote mixing amp uh, app. It is geared primarily at monitor mixing, uh, where you could have stations of people on stage and they could take control of their monitor mix and it's actually bi-directional, meaning on iPad, they're logging into the console and they have control over the levels, the individual input levels in their entire bus that is that is feeding them. Uh, I think you can do up to 16 iPads, I believe, on one system. Uh, so it can control it. Uh, as a front of house engineer, you could use the same thing and control your mix bus with it, but that's as far as it goes. It doesn't give you uh, EQ control, all kinds of other control. We, we haven't developed that app yet. Uh, in terms of pure remote control where you can get to everything on the console, that is through VNC. Uh, you can take VNC, like what you're looking at on screen right now is actually VNC control of the app, uh, of the console itself right there. So I'm uh, controlling it from a remote com com computer there, excuse me. Uh, will then you be able to network with Meyer Galileo Galaxy and others using ABB in the future? Yes, absolutely, it will. Uh, and that is going to more than likely happen through the ABB Milan protocol. Uh, we are working on that protocol as we speak. So yes, uh, it, that, a lot of that will happen. And not only just Galileo, but any of the other products uh, like Elacoustics and uh, et cetera, that are offering Milan compatibility, we will have uh, audio transport to that. How would you describe this difference in sound quality between S6L and Profile? Well, the, the sound quality really is in a few things here. Uh, we've moved, uh, Obviously, we're at a higher sample rate now. Uh, it is a completely different preamp and converter design. Uh, so there, you know, we're, you're asking me to compare the uh, the taste of apples to oranges here. You know, so uh, but in terms of just description, I, I think there's probably a lot more detail in what you're hearing now, a little more depth in what you're hearing now. Uh, we're on 32-bit float now. Is that right? What? Maybe maybe Ryan needs to answer that because I'm spacing it. Uh, but we're uh, on a floating port architecture as opposed to a fixed point architecture now. Uh, so, you know, yeah, a lot of differences in it. I think to a man, you could talk to anybody that, that has moved from uh, that series of console to S6L. They, they notice a marked improvement in sound quality, self-included, self-included. Yeah, and Ryan says, yes, and running 64-bit. That's right, yes. Do all the S6L control surfaces engines IRO racks offer dual power supplies for redundancy? Every one except for, let's see, engines, yeah, engines and surfaces offer N plus one. So it's actually dual redundancy plus another supply that you could hot swap in. Uh, the stage racks uh, offer dual supplies with the exception of stage 16. I think, I believe it's single supply only for stage 16, but the others are uh, redundant supplies, yes. Uh, can the SC48 receive AVB streams from the S6L? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no there, and it's for a couple of reasons. Uh, the AVB stream in SC48 is 48K, S AVB stream in uh, S6L is 96K, and you have to remember there are control protocols in both of those, and they're different control protocols. It's not just a matter of getting audio back and forth, even if we could connect AVB from S6L to that SC48 stage rack, we couldn't control it because we could control the preamp because it's a completely different uh, protocol there. So uh, unfortunately, no there. 
the stage boxes, uh, stage 16, oh, I'm sorry, let me re ask the question here first, sorry. Are the stage boxes quiet enough to place near musicians in an orchestra pit, for example? I remember the previous generation having quite a bit of fan noise. Uh, I would say to you, if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna place uh, stage boxes around a stage where, where noise is an issue, I would use stage 16 to do that right now. That is unquestionably the quietest box we have. I mean, it is whisper quiet. It was designed to work on a stage as a drop box. So that's certainly the one I would use there. Now, I would truthfully tell you, I think our fan noise in our other components, uh, stage 64 and stage 32, is too loud to do that, especially for an orchestra, it would be too loud. That said, we are working on changing that and fixing that problem. We're, we got guys working on that challenge right now. So. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do something with it and spend some hardware to change that and make them a little more adaptable in those settings. Why did Avid choose Ethernet AVB as a networking interconnect? Okay, I can answer this one very easily for you and I actually enjoy answering this question for people because uh, obviously uh, Network protocols like Dante are very popular today uh, and rightly so they do a great job with that network protocol but it is a closed standard. ABB is an open standard. As a company, I don't think we would have ever designed a product of this scale with a network protocol that is owned by another company. It's not an open standard. We, we would be totally at the bay of their development in terms of our entire backbone architecture. So uh, again, just to reiterate, we do not in any way wanna push Dante away. We want them as interconnected to our systems as we can possibly be. But in terms of what we would build and support, AVB had to be the backbone here. It's, an, it's the only open standard out there. If Dante were our backbone and they were to go out of business, we would be dead in the water. There's no way we would have done it, I don't think. Unless, unless we would have owned the company. If we would have bought the company and then put it in, then yes, maybe. Uh, but we would have never done that. I mean, there's just a rich history of company owning network protocols that have gone under. Cobra Sound, EtherSound, all of them. Uh, if you had a product that was based on those protocols, you would be dead in the water once they went out of business, you know, or you would have to pick up and do something else. So again, just to say, ABB is going to be a is a great choice for our backbone. You're going to see this develop over time. It's coming. It's a long race there, not a short one. And in the interim, we will make as many. Uh, attempts at connecting to all the protocols out there as we can possibly do. We, we realize it's a rich world. You gotta be able to connect to all of them, right? Uh, what is the S6L plugin format? It, it is, uh, is it an open format? It is AAX DSP, meaning that the plugins, because our plugin architecture runs on an HDX card, it's separated from our mix engine, even though it resides in the same housing. Uh, it resides on the other side of a PCI bus and does all of its processing independent of the mix engine. So it's essentially running on a Pro Tools card. It's not the exact same card. It's been reaffirmed a little bit to do that, uh, but it's all AAX DSP. So AAX native will not run on this system. It has to be a DSP plugin uh, and compatible with PC, okay? All right, how are we doing here? We'll go maybe one or two more questions here and then we'll probably knock it on the head, I'm guessing. What is the S6L plugin format? Yeah, nope, did that one already. Does virtual sound check work the same as it used to? Uh, I say on whole, yes, and in fact, it works better than it's ever worked right now. I mean, you have the ability, if you guys will remember in the older venue systems, if you were gonna go from microphones to playback, it required essentially a restart of the console, a complete DSP rebuild, it took time, especially if you had lots of plugins, it would take time. That changeover is instantaneous today. You do not have to reboot to do it. In fact, you can do it on a per channel basis. You can go down through our menu system on the channels and actually choose uh, what plug, uh, what the input path for a given channel. So you can choose it as a Pro Tools playback or a microphone playback, et cetera. So yeah, it's it's great, but you can you can do it so much faster and so much more elegantly now than we used to. Can you tell us about the offline software? Okay, so the offline software is great. It, it works exactly like the actual console software with one exception, and that is plugins, right? So you cannot load or instantiate a plugin in standalone because that stuff is built in DSP on a separate card outside of, of the computer you would be operating on, so you can't do it. But everything short of that is capable on the standalone software. And again, you, you are just gonna open that standalone software 
and basically choose what size system you're going to build. You're going to choose your control surface, your racks, et cetera, and build a show pile accordingly to that. Okay. All right. So I think that's going to about do it. That's right on the app. Well, we did that right almost to the minute there. That's fantastic. All right. So let me remind you of a couple of things here. Let's see. I, uh, that you okay i see uh so you uh once this webinar is done which it will be here shortly uh you will get sent a link for the replay if you want to be able to uh, uh go review it and look through things you can do that it is going to be up on our website i'm sure or maybe I, i'm not sure where they're going to post it exactly but we'll, it, the links will come in that email so uh yeah it will be available with all webinars on demand at avid.com backslash live dash sound dash webinars all right. Well, guys, thanks. That was fun. I, I always love talking about that product and, and or that process and that whole concept of the Unified Platform. It's such a fun thing to work on. I tell you, we, we just are having a great time working on it here and uh, making this product really something special. So I hope you get a chance to get your ears on it. I hope you get a chance to get your hands on it. I think you're going to love it once you start working with it. All right. So I'll see you guys throughout the week. As you guys know, I'm online all week now. So stop into some of those other webinars. We'll see you around. Thank guys. Thank you guys for coming. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.